Isikia omentata, a very fancy way of saying hamburgers, or at least the closest thing that ancient Rome had to them. And that is what we're making today. So thank you to Blinkist for sponsoring this video as we make imperial hamburgers and marvel at the fact that ancient Rome had talking cows. This time on Tasting History. So this recipe is pretty much the closest thing that we have to an ancient Roman hamburger or meatball because it's not terribly specific in exactly how to shape it, but it wouldn't have been served as a sandwich like a hamburger today. Ah, hamburgers. But over on the channel Invicta, I will put a link in the description, they have a new video where they imagine what a Roman hamburger would be like if it was served like a modern hamburger, but only using ingredients that would have been available at the time. What would the bun be like? Does it have cheese? And what exactly would go on it? One of the cool things about the recipe that we have today, which is from Apicius, is that he calls for a very specific condiment to be served with it. Isicchia omentata, minced meat with call fat. Chop meat and pound with white breadcrumbs soaked in wine. Pound pepper, garum, and myrtleberry if you like. Shape the meat with pine nuts and pepper placed inside. Wrap in the call and cook served with karenum. That karenum is the condiment, and basically it's grape must or juice, sometimes wine, that has been reduced into a light syrup. So for this recipe, what you'll need is one pound or 450 grams of meat, now the recipe is not specific in what meat should be used. In other similar recipes in that section of the book, he mentions squid and mussels and pheasant, peacock, and pig brains. Luckily for me, he gives us carte blanche in this recipe, so I'm going with beef because that's what we're discussing. A few large slices of stale bread crumbled up without the crust, about enough to make a cup. A half cup or 120 milliliters of wine, one teaspoon of pepper, one tablespoon of garum or another fish sauce, a few myrtle berries or juniper berries if you can't find myrtle berries. And the recipe says that you can or cannot use them, so if you want, just leave them out. A quarter cup or 30 grams of pine nuts, some call fat, we will get into that ingredient later, and three cups or 700 milliliters of grape juice or wine. Now making these videos requires a beaucoup de research, and lately I haven't had time to really read anything that wasn't for the channel. Not complaining, but I am interested in things other than food and history. And that is why I have really been enjoying my subscription to today's sponsor, Blinkist. Blinkist has thousands of nonfiction titles spread over 27 categories, and they condense them into 15 minute text or audio explainers called Blinks. It allows me to get a quick overview of the book and then I can decide if I wanna go read the entire thing, because I found for a lot of topics, authors, put in a lot of padding, and 15 minutes gets you pretty much all you need. But then for some books, it's obvious that after 15 minutes, there is a treasure trove of information in the entire book, and so I go and listen to the full audiobook. Also, Blinkist has full audiobooks. Recently, I listened to, and heartily recommend, The Blinks for Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. I was so intrigued that now I'm listening to the full book. And I'm thinking it's going to be the same for Napoleon's Buttons, which I just listened to The Blinks for today. It's all about chemistry's effect on history, and it includes the molecules for salt and caffeine and, yes, John Townsend, even nutmeg. So if you love learning about all sorts of topics, but you just don't have time to cover everything that you want to read, Blinkist is for you. And for the first hundred people that click the link in the description, Blinkist.com slash Tasting History, you'll get a seven day free trial that you can cancel at any time, as well as 25% off if you choose to get a full membership. Now, on to the burgers. So the first thing you gotta do is make that condiment garenum. It takes a little while. Just pour the grape juice or wine into a saucepan and set it over a low flame until it reduces down to about a third of its original quantity. While it reduces, add your bread to a bowl with the wine and let it soak while you chop your meat into very fine pieces. Then add the meat to a mortar and take some of the bread and put it in the mortar as well. Then pound them together. Depending on the size of your mortar, you might have to do this in a few stages, but it's really cool because it actually comes out almost like ground beef. In a clean mortar, grind half of the pepper, and if you're using myrtle or juniper berry, grind those in as well. Then in a bowl, add the meat and the spices and the garum and mix. Now at this point, the recipe says to add the pine nuts and pepper, and it's not specific if it's ground, so I can't imagine that you're biting into full peppercorns, maybe, I don't know, but 
I don't want to, so I'm going to give them a light grinding to make them coarse. Then mix those in with the meat as well. Then you can shape them into either balls or patties. How you want to shape them is really going to depend on how you want to cook them, which we will get to later. For now, it is time for the call, which is coming from inside the house. No, I'm just kidding. It came from the butcher. So call fat is the thin web of fat that encases the internal organs of some animals. And it's often used to encase meat. And the great thing about call, as opposed to other casings, is that it's fat. I'm not fat, I'm big bones! So in a recipe like this, where the meat is lean and there is no other fat added, that call should melt when cooked and really flavor the dish. So cut a few pieces of call and wrap it around the patties. It should stick to itself. Now before I cook them, I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe to Tasting History and hit the notification bell so you never miss an episode. Now when it does come to cooking these, it's really up to you how you do it. They could have been boiled or fried or put over an open fire, baked even, or like I'm going to do, put in a pan over an open flame. See how that call fat just melts? Perfect. Now as I cook these Isikia omentata, made with beef, let me tell you about these amazing Roman cows. The ancient Romans were all about their cattle. Why are you so obsessed with me? But with good reason, because these cows were very, very special. First of all, they were pretty much money. The very word for money is derived from them, for cattle are the basis of all wealth. Varro is referring to the word pecunia, which comes from pecus, which means cattle. And it's where we get our word pecuniary today. Etymological side note, my favorite type of side note, Varro also talks about how the word for Italy actually comes from the word for bull, Itali. And the name was bestowed because of the number and beauty of its cattle and the great number of calves. Though he also says the name could have come from Italus, which was a bull that Hercules chased up the peninsula from Sicily. And Aristotle completely abandons the bovine theme by saying it was named after Italos, which was an old legendary king. So who really knows? Anyway, I digress. Now besides being the literal word for cash, cattle were also a great way to make money. Cicero tells a story of Cato the Elder expounding on how best to make money in farming. There is a famous saying of old Cato's. When asked how best to make an estate most profitable, he replied, successfully raising cattle. And second best, raising cattle with some success. And third, raising cattle with little success. And fourth, raising crops. And when the questioner asked, how about banking? Cato replied, how about murder? Cato loved his cows, hated bankers, but loved his cows. And actually, with the exception of hauling firewood, his oxen received feast days off of work, which made them special, since there is no holiday for mules, horses, or donkeys. Well, that just doesn't seem fair. Now, while his oxen would work the farm, his cows would produce milk to make some of the healthiest cheese that the Romans knew, though it didn't agree with everyone. Of the cheeses which are made from milk, those made of cow's milk have the most nutrient, but when eaten are discharged with most difficulty. Now there were different cows and they were worth different amounts. Pliny the Elder says, In our part of the world, the most valuable cattle are those of Epirus, owing, it is said, to the attention paid to their breed by King Pyrrhus of the Pyrrhic victory. Now, that cow was supposed to be rather large and impressive, but there is another impressive cow that both Pliny the Elder and Herodotus marvel at. Among the Garamantes are the cattle that go backward as they graze, the reason being that their horns curve forward. Therefore, not being able to go forward, since the horns would stick in the ground, they walk backward, grazing. I don't think I've ever seen a cow go backwards. Pretty sure they can't go downstairs, though maybe that's an old wives' tale. I don't know, anyone got a cow? So now you're probably saying, well, okay, these, these cows are pretty cool, but no cooler than any other cow in the world. So what makes these Roman cows so special that you would devote an entire episode to them? <laughs> well, what if I told you they could talk? You're a liar. Livy records that in the year 461 BC, that the heavens were seen to blaze and the earth was shaken with a prodigious quake that a cow had spoken, a thing which had found no credence the year before, was now believed. Among other portents, there was even a rain of meat, which is said to have been intercepted by vast numbers of birds flying round in the midst of it. Meat showers, talking cows, <laughs> surely you jest. And I would agree if it was an isolated incident, but it's not. In 208 BC, Marcellus, known as the Sword of Rome, hesitated to go into battle against Hannibal due to some disturbing omens. 
temples being struck by lightning, mice eating gold. And it was reported that an ox had uttered human speech and that a boy had been born with an elephant's head. And Pliny confirms that it was not uncommon prodigy among the ancients for an ox to speak. Upon such a fact being announced to the Senate, they were in the habit of holding a meeting in the open air. Now you may wonder why the Senate would care about a talking cow enough to hold their meeting in the open air. And it was probably to go find out what political opinions the cow had. It's like a cow's opinion. It's moo. For during one election between Plautius and Hirius, it was noted we have the official record that the Praetor reported to the Senate at Rome that it was a cow which said in Latin, Plautius, rather than Hirius. I love that he lets you know that it was in Latin because any other language would have been far less impressive. And even if a cow did remain mute, they were capable of so much more. I know that it is from the putrefied body of cattle that there spring the sweetest bees, those honey mothers from which the Greeks therefore call bees the ox sprung. His confidence leaves me in no doubt that it's true. Now you'd think that these chatty, apian-sponding bovine who created so much wealth would be treated like members of the family, and that was somewhat true until it came time for sacrifice. Well, this is pretty awkward. A bull to thee, Neptune, a bull to thee, beauteous Apollo. And of the many animals that the Romans sacrificed to the gods, cows, or specifically oxen and bulls, were considered some of the best. Bulls are selected as the very choicest of victims, and are offered up as the most approved sacrifice for appeasing the gods. Neptune tested, Apollo approved, and there were other gods who enjoyed their beef as well. First, the god Mars, though he actually enjoyed a varied diet called a suovetorilia. A pig, sus, a sheep, ovis, and a bull, torus. It was originally used as a way to bless or purify land, much the way that we might use sage today, albeit a lot more expensive. And Cato the Elder gives us a very detailed description of what all had to be done, including the prayer, Father Mars, I pray and beseech thee that thou be gracious and merciful to me, my house, and my household, to which intent I have bidden this suovetorilia to be led around my land, my ground, my farm that thou keep away, ward off, and remove sickness, seen and unseen, barren and destruction, ruin and unseasonable influence. And don't skip that part, because as Pliny says, without prayers, the sacrifice is worthless. Now Mars was an agricultural god, but as he began to really gain fame as the god of war, which is usually how we recognize him now, the suovetorilia also became used to bless armies during times of war. And that actually brings us back to our other beef-loving god, Apollo. In 211 BC, as Rome was under threat from the Carthaginian Hannibal Barca, the first Ludi Apollinaris were held to secure Apollo's support for the Roman army. It was a day of equestrian games punctuated by dramatic performances, much like the halftime show at the Super Bowl. In later years, the games were extended to an entire week, starting on July 6th, the day that I am posting this video. So, one, Happy Ludi Apollinaris, and two, I do hope that you pre-ordered your cow. Because during the games there were sacrifices including a bull with golden gilt horns sacrificed to Apollo, and a heifer with gilt horns to his mother Latona, most famous for turning rude peasants into frogs after they wouldn't let her drink out of their pond, a story which continuously caught the imagination of 17th and 18th century painters. I do not know why. By the way, it was during festivals like this when most people got to eat beef, because it, it wasn't the most popular meat in ancient Rome, and for a lot of people it was actually kind of forbidden except for times of, of sacrifice when there was a lot of beef to go around. But you had to be quick and hope that there was not a guy like Milo around. This is what Milo was like. When at Zeus's feast, he lifted up the weight of a four-year-old heifer and carried the huge animal lightly on his shoulders. In front of the altar of Pisa, he cut up into pieces of meat this unyoked heifer, and he ate the whole thing all by himself. I bet he had a tummy ache after that. But I also bet he would have really liked the most cow-centric of Roman festivals. And it features yet another steak-loving god, Tellus Mater, Mother Earth. It began during the reign of Numa Pompilius, who was the second legendary king of Rome, and they had been having a bad time agriculturally. The god Faunus came to the king in a dream and said the answer was a sacrifice to Tellus Mater. By the death of cattle, Tellus must be placated. Two cows, that is. 
Let a single heifer yield two lives for the rites. One cow, two lives. The answer? Forda, where the festival gets its name. Fordikidia was named for Forde cows. A Forda cow is one that is carrying an unborn calf, because on this day several pregnant cows are officially and publicly sacrificed in the curie. And Mother Earth was not the only lady who loved her beef. Hey, where's the beef? Because during the Empire, Magna Mater, or the Great Mother of the Gods, was often wooed with the taurobolium, a practice of sacrificing a bull adorned in flowers and gold. The later Roman Christian author Prudentius claimed that then they would take the blood and let it flow over them like a baptism. Though you gotta take whatever he says with a grain of salt when it comes to cows because the early Christians had a rightful bone to pick with Roman cows. First, there was something called damnatio ad bestias, damnation to the beasts. It was a form of capital punishment most often reserved for military traders, runaway slaves, and Christians, where the victim would be killed by animals, including lions and tigers and bears and bulls. Most famously, the martyred saints Perpetua and Felicity were gored by a bull in a North African arena. But even worse, in my book, was the brazen bull, a diabolical, if possibly fictional, torture and execution device, where the victim was roasted alive inside of a massive bronze bull. If it existed, it began in ancient Greece and Sicily, and only later on was used for Christians, most notably Saint Eustace. According to tradition, it was the Emperor Hadrian who ordered Eustace and his wife and his children to be roasted in the brazen bull. Though again, it might have actually never even existed. But just the idea of it is enough to put some people off beef. Though not me, because I'm ready for my Isikia Omentata. And here we are, Isikia Omentata. Let's give it a shot. I'm curious. Oh, it actually cuts through really easily. I kind of thought that the fat would like have some give to it, but it doesn't. It, it just, like I said, it just kind of melted in. It did caramelize, burn, uh, <laughs> around the edges. Um, but yeah. And it's interesting because it really does look like a burger inside, albeit with pine nuts. Here we go. Beef with call fat. Mmm. Mmm. Peppery. It's very chewy because it's not ground meat. It eats more like a steak, but it's good. Um, I don't know if the call fat like adds a specific flavor other than just fat. It smelled earlier, it kind of smelled like a like a butcher shop, like but that unpleasant smell of a butcher shop, but you don't get it when you eat it. But now I'm going to add some of that karenum just to see what that does to it. It's nice and thick. I'm really excited for this. Mmm. Mmm. That's the way to do it. He's right. Apicius, or whoever wrote Terra Coquinaria, was right. It's got to have that condiment. It's super sweet against the pepper, and they just, like, they, they, they work perfectly together. The garum does not, it, it doesn't overpower the flavor at all. It adds saltiness, so the other flavors really sparkle, but you don't get that, that traditional garum flavor as much as some other dishes that I've used it in. Overall, A minus, not A plus, A minus, uh, but it could totally be used as a burger or, or meatballs. I think actually better though as a burger because it does hold together pretty darn well. So whether you use call fat or not, you should, but I do suggest that you kind of try to recreate some of this uh, using some of the ingredients, especially that karenum. You could honestly, I could put that in a lot of things. I think it'd go really nice on some fish. Anyway, thank you again to Blinkist for sponsoring this video and make sure to follow me on Instagram at Tasting History with Max Miller and I will see you next time on Tasting History.